Hello and welcome to a very special episode of That Shooting Show. My name's Steve Anderson. I am your humble host. Uh, we are joined by the mighty Gaz Evans. Um, and we are going to be looking at the SAPSA Level 3 Handgun Nationals stages. And the two of us are going to provide some insight on uh, what we think these stages look like and what you can do. That match is coming up pretty soon, right, Gaz? Uh, yeah, pre-match starts next week, Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Main match is next week, Thursday, fr uh, sorry, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So good, about a week. So that's good because, as we'll discuss, there's not a requirement or an ability to get significantly better at this stuff. Um, but there is an opportunity to know what you're getting into and do a little bit of live fire, do a little bit of dry fire, just to prepare yourself, not for the stages, but for the challenges. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Gaz and I just confirmed that neither one of us has studied this document extensively. So, <laughs> but that's okay because we're so great at this. We don't need to study it extensively. And maybe there's something to be learned there as well. Uh, Gaz, did you know that Jay doesn't even bother looking at the matchbooks anymore? I heard him on one of your recent episodes that you did together. It might have been the National Course of Fire you did last year, where he said he doesn't even really look anymore. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the only thing we'd be looking for is strong hand, weak hand, um, and any sort of unusual start position. But he practices all those things every day anyway, so it doesn't really matter, you know? Yeah. Um, all right, let me go ahead and share my screen, and we will take a look. All right, so the first thing we have is a beautiful cover page with a lovely logo on it. And is is SAPSA the Steve Anderson Practical Shooting Association, or does it mean something different? Uh, technically, it means something different, but I like the first version. <laughs> All right, and the IPSC format is, uh, was, is it three smalls, two mediums, and one large? Yes, so that's the format we try and stick to. Okay, but they're not necessarily in that order, which I, which was the first thing I noticed. Um, yes. Even though that's the ratio, I guess I've, I've never looked at this so in depth before, but I, I think it's interesting that they're not in that order. Of course, that's something you're you're very used to. Yeah, at, at our nationals, it's potential. It's it's there's a fairly high potential that you might not have that structure in a day. Uh, primarily because we shoot eight stages and maybe the way they design the courses or the way their stages are laid out physically, you might end up shooting more points on one day than the other and vice versa. So it's quite common for us. Do you have any, I, I'm sure you don't, but between short, medium and long, do you even care anymore? Uh, no, not really. Okay. And before we get into this, um, I am hearing... Uh, on when I'm talking to people in mental management and when I hear and look at other social media posts, um, have you ever attempted to come out at about 75 or 85 percent, just kind of take it easy on the first stage? Was that ever a thing you did? It was a thing, but we it was pre 2020 that that was a thing that I was doing. Okay. Uh, yeah. The downside I found with that personally is that when I did that, it was difficult to get to 100. So I'd end up spending more of the match in that 75 to 80 or 85 percent area than what I would have liked to have. Yeah. And if your first stage is a high point stage, you don't want 75 percent of those points. You know, <laughs> you want you want 95 yeah. to 100 percent of those points. Um, yeah. And what people don't understand about that is it's a it's a different form of conscious override. So under trying is just as damaging as over trying. Now the score will be slightly better if you under try, mm. uh, because you're less likely to make a big mistake. But yeah, you know that's that's uh, one of the first things we teach people in all of the classes we're going to be doing in South Africa is let's get away from the conscious control of speed. Let's stop speeding up. Let's stop slowing down. If we're shooting for score, let's shoot at the speed of sight. Yeah. Oh, and just, man, how much fun did we have getting to 100% on virtually every American classifier we undertook? Oh, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. So great. And I just remember 
every time you wanted to smoke, I was like, oh yeah, you want to smoke? Yeah, that sounds pretty great. Okay, get me to 100%. We can have smoke. <laughs> yes. Oh, the reward structure works. Yeah, so. sure, sure does. All right. So one of my favorite things about Ipsic and something that I wish would be virtually universal is starting anywhere. So here we are on stage one, start anywhere, 30 rounds, 14 Ipsic targets, two plates and three Ipsic no shoots. So yeah. when you're looking at a start anywhere stage on a on a diagram, can you can you come to a conclusion just looking at the diagram, or would you need to see it in person to really get into that? Um, if this if the stage is relatively simple, it might be worth saying, okay, look at starting somewhere else other than the obvious. But if I look at stage one like we're looking at now, that's something that I'd want to see on the ground before I made a decision because it looks like there'll be a lot of based on the picture, it looks like there'll be a lot of left and right movements. So it would be a case of trying to minimize the amount of left and right that I do so that I can work more efficiently down the, the course of fire and potentially up the course of fire, depending on the layout. Okay. And one of the things I've learned is that anytime people have an opportunity to try different stage plans on a stage, nobody moves backwards as quickly as they move forwards, at least in my experience. Um, yep. So if moving forward makes sense, everybody will be able to do that more aggressively uh safely from a safety standpoint and also safely from a dq standpoint moving forward will yes. be more reliable more efficient so yeah i really like what you said because they're going to make you go to this port uh this middle port on the right they're going to make you go to that yes um but if we can stay in a straight line down this hallway that will reduce the time because it looks like they're going to force us into the back uh, left corner yep. of the stage, the back right corner of the stage, that port, and definitely the front uh, left of the demarcated area. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I've noticed about, so let's call this a start anywhere. Every stage makes you go everywhere. That's what stage designers do. They're forcing you to the port. They're forcing you to the corner. Um, but when I look at people run dramatically different stage plans, I don't see a huge difference from stage plan alone on a stage that makes you go everywhere. Yeah. Unless you're doubling up on a movement or, or a section of the uh, stage in terms of movement that you're doubling that distance, then it might have a small bearing, but on a big stage like this, that, that difference is going to be fairly negligible from what we can see now. Mm -hmm. And do you ever get involved in counting steps or things of that nature when you're coming up with stage plans? Uh, it's probably something that I should be doing more of, but I, it's not something I've ever really paid attention to because I want to be more confident in my stage plan than I am in the number of steps in my stage plan. Well, I just meant when you're making decisions. Yeah, sure. But it it just seems to me that if I have to go everywhere, and as you said, as long as I'm not double tracking or doing something dumb, you know, a question like that presumes we're not going to do something dumb, you know, yeah, uh, something that a beginner shooter might do just out of ignorance. Um, yeah. But in terms of the targets, this looks pretty straightforward. Um, because you know the range so, so well, how how yeah. far are those plates likely to be? I did, um. I don't know Cape Town's ranges and bays all that well. I'm trying to think of which one is likely be, to be stage one. Um, so they've got the distance specified there of 5 to 20 meters in the briefing. Ah, I see. Okay. Yep. So we can sort of bank on those numbers because when they do the range vetting before the match begins, they'll sort of check that those numbers correlate um, when they're doing that vetting process. Okay. And so while we're talking about the plates, it's important to remember that um, this specific range in Cape Town at KSSC, they they renowned for having small 150 mil square plates, which translates to roughly a six inch plate. That's what we'll be shooting at most of the time when they refer to a plate from experience. And in the in the vast national champion experience that you have gaz you're shooting production optics i assume yes i am okay 
What is the best way to hit those 20 meter plates the first time? So call your shot. <laughs> if you fire the gun and the glowy red dot is not on the plate, is that likely to be a hit? <laughs> Unfortunately not, no. So there you have it. Thank you for tuning in. Put the dot in the middle of the plate. Um, Put the dot in the middle of the plate. And if you want to learn how to do that, you're going to have to see Steve when he's out here in May. <laughs> in South Africa. That's right. Now, um, you're still shooting partials in the center of the, of the available target area? Yes, I am. Unless it's it's um, obnoxiously close or something like that, and it's fairly available in terms of A zone space. But 99% of the time, yeah, center of available target area. And I don't see a lot of opportunities to stay moving on this stage. Do you? No, not from the picture. And from memory of Cape Town, there's not a lot of opportunity to stay moving. Okay. There'll be a, there'll be a lot of sort of positional stages where we have to go to this position and shoot this position and shoot. There'll be the odd opportunity for you to shoot something while you're still moving in some way or another but most of it's going to be what I call positional. Okay. Boy, it would sure, it, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it would sure be yeah. nice to to get into this bottom right corner and uh, get all that front stuff on the left, but they're probably not going to make that available to you. No. If they do, it would be really cool. Mm-hmm. But, oh, we'll and change that, dynamic, yeah. that reminds me of something that a lot of people don't know. Um, walking the entire perimeter of the fault line as opposed to just going where your instinct takes you. Um, maybe not this stage specifically, but I've seen numerous stages where walking the entire perimeter of the demarcated area may show you something that you won't, that you wouldn't see, you know? Yeah. So make sure to do that. Okay. Yeah. No big surprises here. Let's look at stage two. It is a medium course. 12 IPSC paper, two IPSC no shoots from two to 25 meters, holding a fishing rod with the line in the water as demonstrated. All right. And, and sitting on the chair. Sitting on the chair. That's right. Okay. And it doesn't, oh, both hands. Okay. And then they'll demonstrate how they want you to do that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, look, yeah. go everywhere and shoot what you see. That looks familiar. <laughs> Looks good. Yeah. Um, um, one thing I would I would like to remind people that they may not know is when you're holding a prop like this, you want to ignore it to the best of your ability, but you do want to cast it away pretty decisively. Um, yeah. If you drop it and that line gets tied up around your ankle somehow, that's going to be that's going to be a mess. Um, if you trip over it, that could contribute to a DQ. You want to get that thing away from your shooting stuff. I don't know if aggressively is the right word, but decisively for sure. For yeah. sure. No, for sure. And if we look at this stage, when we look at the starting position, there's a lot of extras in there. And those are just designed to be there as distractions. So what will happen to some competitors is that you're sitting in a chair, you're holding a fishing rod, plus there's a bridge by the looks of it on the course of fire. Um, potentially a body of water. It depends on how extensively they're going to build the bay or the stage for this map there's it's filled with a lot of distractions so the more you can notice the distractions but just apply them um without them having an influence on your stage plan the better off you that you'll be the more those influence your stage plan and distract you the more influence they'll have on your output in the results that's exactly right yeah i remember i was at a match in florida and this shooter named lesgar murdoch they call him speedy uh, they have the, uh, we call them kitty pools, you know, the little miniature plastic pools for children. Yes. And they had it stuck right in the middle of the stage and he just leaped over it, you know, and instead of going around it, he jumped over it. Um, if you thought you could jump over that without, well, of course they're going to make you shoot that middle section on the bridge anyway, so it doesn't matter. Never mind. Yeah. 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 And uh, one of the unknowns with the bridge is that we don't know if that's going to be a seesaw type bridge or if that's going to be just a rigid bridge that's relatively small for you to position yourself on in terms of your feet. Yep. So we don't know what that's going to be, but if we have a look at that before the match starts, then we know where we stand. And do you have a sort of a go-to method for handling teeter-totters? 
or is everyone different enough that you just kind of play with it and figure it out? Uh, we don't get a lot of experience uh, on those teeter totters, um, but depending on how they build this, it may require us to be have the teeter totter on one side to engage a target and have a trip to the other side to be able to see the target. So there's something that's also something to play play a role in, but we'll only see that probably once we get to walk the stage or potentially um, if anyone gets to see pre-match video or squad shooting the pre-match. Yeah. And your, your statement was so important. There are a lot of distractions here that don't need to be distractions. If you're sitting there worried about the fishing pole, worried about the chair, worried about the bridge, you'll not be shooting well. Um, prepare for those the best you can and then ignore them the best that you can. Yeah. Um, outside of that, looks pretty much like go everywhere and shoot what you see. They're going to force you to go to these places. That's pretty yeah. obvious. Okay. Anything to add on that one? No, I think we're good there. That looks good. All right. Stage three. Competitor starts with both feet touching the mark. 22 rounds, 10 paper, two steel, one no shoot. Plates will be guaranteed to be at 15 meters probably. Yeah, most likely looking at it. And so I'm seeing an opportunity potentially to back up on one and two and potentially advance, as you might say, uh, a little bit on nine and ten. Doesn't yes. look like you can be shooting anything as you're moving forward. Um, so in this, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, yeah, I can. In this thing that I'm indicating here, this this little corner, there may be a sweet spot in there where a lot of that's available. This this guy won't be available from that sweet spot for sure. Um, no, do you yeah. think look more like target markers or foot markers? I, I run target markers most of the time. Yeah. Uh, or some sort of other visual. It's If it's a very specific stage that requires my feet to be somewhere, then I'll look for foot markers, but that's not often at all. Um, if I can't use a target marker, I'll use a vision barrier or something along those lines as a marker for the target. Yeah. The only point I wanted to make is um, ideally we'd find a way to stay moving on these two guys if we can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how we engage this one. Um, your the IPSC, so, so USPSA, the rules don't permit showing you a target that breaks the 180. That's a relatively recent the last few years. Well, it's longer than that. Does does IPSC allow targets to be presented that potentially break the 180? It has happened in the past, but most of our nationals now, the the general ruling would be if the target's visible, you can engage it, obviously within reason. Um, so that's the general rule. They try not to entice that 180 on the line. And I just noticed something. This this guy back here will only be visible from this corner, so that changes that corner quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. But it may open up the that IT8 and IT7 on the right-hand side um, for you to use that to shoot into your last position. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on how long that passage is and how far the small plates are, uh, could encourage you to shoot those while moving. It may depend a little bit on how the reloads work out for production, looking at it quickly. And one of the greatest things about the classes we do in South Africa is when we spend two hours shooting while moving, people that have never even considered taking a partial on the move are now taking partials on the move from eight to 12 meters because the center of brown is usually bigger than the A zone, right? Yeah. When there's a partial involved, yeah. and it's very easy to do. Um, yeah. I would imagine that you're routinely taking partials on the move now when you're able to do that. Yeah, when they're available, I'll do it, yeah. That's great. And the other thing I want to mention on stage planning is when you're coming up with your stage plan, only do the things that you know you can do. Stage planning is not a time to try something or attempt something. It's a time to execute something that you know you can do. Yeah. Cannot, cannot stress that enough. Um, you know what a Texas star is, even though you may not have ever shot one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Texas Falls are cool. I haven't had the opportunity to shoot one yet. Um, Ipsic, it's not in the Ipsic rule book. It's, it's not allowed. Um, but I'll shoot one at one point. 
one of these days. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. you'll get to it in Texas. But I remember I'd been working on shooting on a move and I attempted to engage a Texas star while moving at about 12 yards, 12 meters. And it went like you'd expect. I knew I couldn't do it. I just wanted to try it. And so that's yeah. when I learned the match is not for trying places. Oh, sorry, trying things. Okay, another medium course, 22 rounds, seven paper, three minis, one popper, one metal plate, and one no-shoot target with two swingers. Uh, start position, both feet touching the mark. Okay, what do you see? Sort of on that front left. Yep. Sorry? What do you see? Uh, from what I can see, there's some steps in the demarcated area, we don't know how high those steps are going to be or how awkward they might be to climb. What would, would from what I can see where we start, that would be where we end. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know what that's going to look like. Again, it's it's a bit of a distraction. It's something we see when we get there. Uh, hopefully we get a chance to see it before we do the walkthrough to actually execute our plans on the stage. The other thing that I'm seeing is that we got mini poppers, which means it's also still roughly about a six inch scoring zone in the head of the popper again sort of six inch steel plate um, what's going to be interesting is how they set up those mini targets on the left hand side of the bay because that we don't get to see a lot of mm -hmm. um, and the, the swinger I've seen what I think they're going to try and build quite a lot in Europe we'll see how they build it there so I'm Impartial on the swinger, we'll have to see how that's set up when we get there. In terms of strategy or in terms of where you're going to take it from? Uh, in terms of strategy. So if it sort of ends up being built the way I think it's going to be built, ideally the timing on that swing is going to be crucial or that swinger array is going to be crucial. And ideally we need to engage both targets from one side. If we start crossing over or we have a missed time on the swinger, it's just going to eat time on that stage. Now, with that kind of presentation, is that likely to be, it looks it looks like it's going to be the maximum distance of the stage. So that's going to be a 15 meter swinger. Mm. Is, is that something yeah. that you would be comfortable two shots on one pass or one shot per pass? Um, depending on the speed of the swingers, one shot per pass most of the time at that distance. And so you're thinking two passes on one side, two passes on the other side, as opposed to trying to go back and forth? Yeah. Either either that strategy, or if they're a true sort of double stack swinger array, it's two on right, uh, two on T1, for example, and then two on T2, both on the same side of the aperture, if it's built the way I think it's going to be. So as oh. one target goes through... One shot as it comes back, one shot. The other one comes through, one shot, and then it goes back, one shot. That's why I think the timing is going to be crucial if it's built that way. Okay, so you think they're they're both going to appear on the same side of the aperture? They might be visible on both sides, but the side that we engage them on, depending on the timing, would probably need to be where we engage them both of the targets from. And again, this is sort of a hybrid of a side and a center presentation. Um, yeah. These, anything that's kind of a center presentation, it is possible to get two on one pass, but it is difficult to call two good shots on one pass. Yeah. And you, you probably already know this, but this is something I've begun telling people because that, because it's pretty generous. I would say, let's just say there's roughly one second of target time meaning the target will be dis will be disappearing or it'll take about a second to reappear let's say okay does that sound yeah. about right one second yeah yeah so that means if it is a let's just say could you even guesstimate a hit factor here gaz on this stage no okay let's call it a mm, 22 rounds. Let's say for argument's sake, it's a six hit factor. Six, okay. All right. So if if that's the case, you have got two and a half seconds to prevent a mic. Three. And what that means is if you're calling an iffy shot on that swinger, you've got two and a half seconds 
to to fix it before it hurts your score. Okay. Yeah. And I do not think it's going to take anywhere near two and a half seconds for that swinger to come back. No, I don't think so. And I would say that six would be the absolute highest this stage could be. Yes. Um, yeah. Because, you you know, waiting for that swinger to appear, depending on how they appear, obviously there's no shooting while that's happening. Obviously that drops the hit factor quite a bit. And one yeah. other thing I'd like to add, are these stairs likely to be wooden? Uh, I would say that they would be wooden, yes. Okay. So I just want to let everybody know, if you are wearing cleats, I know our buddy uh, – Brendan, he used to wear two different color shoes. Is that Brendan Cock? Cock. Yes, yes. Okay. Brendan, yes. He used to wear plastic cleats. I don't know if he still does. Traditional plastic cleats are suicide on wood, and they're a hundred percent suicide on wet wood. If that's wood and it gets damp, plastic cleats are going to be ice skates. So, yep. If you're wearing plastic cleats, and there was range likely to be gravel or d dirt or sand, or what's what's the range likely to be? A combination of um, some gravel and grass, mostly. So cleats are okay. I don't I don't know if they're the best, but if if you're a guy that wears cleats and you know there's going to be wood in the match and it could be damp ever with dew or rain potentially, cleats are suicide on wet wood. I just want to let everybody know that. Yeah, I can vouch for that. I've had a. I used to wear cleats as well, um, wooden top stage, uh, sort of flat floor wood in a container. I slipped and I tore a hole in my groin. So be aware of your footwear. It's often underestimated. And I, I don't know specifically, but I would imagine brass on a wooden floor would be also bad for cleats. Yeah. Then it becomes roller skates instead of ice skates. <laughs> All right. So wear your cleats if you want to, but bring another pair of shoes if if we think there's going to be wood there. Do yep. you take more than one pair of shoes to the match? I do, but not more than one type. Um, it's all sort of um, trail running shoes now, and I'll have a pair in case one pair gets wet, basically, or potentially broken. I've had that before as well. You don't want to be going out there with uh, duct tape on your shoe. Yeah. All right, here's the bed prop. Uh 10 10 yeah. paper, two minis, one no shoot, 22 rounds, 15 meter max. Unloaded all magazines on the table. All right. And it looks like they're going to have your head as far away from the gun as possible. That's to be expected. Yeah. Um one thing I'd like to mention is there is no point in trying to cheat this start position. Just do whatever the RO tells you to do, right? Yeah. There is nothing you can do with your elbow or pre-positioning your, I mean, maybe you could do something with your legs, but they're not going to let you do that anyway. Um, yeah. Just do what the RO tells you to do. And this would be something that you'd want to drive by Yeah. Um, just to get some idea of, of what the best way to get out of bed and grab a gun is. Okay. Yeah. All right, guys, what else do you see here? Uh, it looks like the first shooting position is going to be at the low port. So that's something that you we don't commonly get an unloaded gun at a low port on a table. So something that would be worth looking at dry firing a little bit is at least learning how to load the gun in the low port. Um, mm -hmm. Or learning what that sort of feels like because it's going to be very common for competitors to get to that table, pick their stuff up, load while they're still standing tall. Once mm -hmm. they've done all the manipulation, then they're going to go into the port. So that's something to pay attention to. Something that's easy to see in the course of fire that you can practice and build confidence on before you even go down to Cape Town or get to the match. Yes. From so there, again, from what I can see, um, we've got 15 meters. That's reasonable. A lot of open targets. Um, and again, it's going to be sort of low ports into another position, into another position, into your final position. So... Not, not a lot from what we can see on the paper in terms of options. Maybe they'll have some sort of build where you can skip an aperture or a port um, by taking a more difficult shot on the target. We'll have to see when we get there, but it looks positioned again. Mm -hmm. And I can promise you that if a competitor is older or overweight or not in great shape, they are going to go out of their way to finish on that low port. Mm. That's that. That is a good point, Jason. And 
it, it would be dependent on how athletic you are. It doesn't appear that saving that low port for the end would be catastrophically stupid, right? Um, I don't know that it would be the best way to do it, but I also don't think it would be immediately awful, especially if we're somebody who's going to have trouble getting up. Um, yes. You know, you could potentially grab that gun and come over here to the left and work your way this way and then finish in the low port. Yeah. Uh, that might not that, be the thing. might. Or it might, that, depending on how close. Yeah. It also may depend on how big the demarcated area is. If it's fairly compact, it's going to have less of an effect. If it's a pretty wide run, it might have more of an effect. So the smaller that demarcated area is, the more it will create options for a variety of different physiques, ages, ideas, etc. Options. And how many rounds do you get in your magazines? Uh, production, we can have 15 rounds in the mag on the start. Okay. But you mean production optics when you say that, right? Yes. Yeah. So, same rule. Standard guns, more. Open gun, as much as possible. Classic, not enough. Uh, I was talking to uh, Shaw Botha yesterday, and he had his uh, he had his World War One relic right there on his desk. And I was like, "Is that thing jammed right now?" He goes, "No, it's working fine." <laughs> Define working, though, Shaw. He's such a fun guy to talk to. I re he's I really like that guy. Um, yeah, I enjoy him a lot. Your general rule: grab the normal number of mags, grab the bare minimum. What What's your general rule on this? Uh, depending on how that low port plays out, I want to try and get away with as little magazine manipulation as possible. So 22 rounds, I might have to pick up off the start position after I've shot through the low port a mag and stow that on a mag uh, magnet for the reload later in the stage. But ideally with where I am now, I want to try and get away with as little mag magazine manipulation as possible. The downside to that is it increases risk. So if I pick up a magazine and I stow it on my magnet and I run and it falls off, now I've got a problem. I've got to go back and fetch it, and that just eats into my time. So it it's going to be something that I'm going to have to call on the day. And it's good something news. that you want to practice. The good news is a Glock magazine is very unlikely to malfunction, uh, mm. unless it's on the ground, you know? <laughs> yes, yeah. But once again, go everywhere, shoot everything. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty simple. Um, the other, the other potential reason for uh, an intermediate shooter would be if they're, if they're not able to call their shots on steel, watching those things fall down takes about a second per steel. Um, a dirt makeup, which is what, you know, we see the round hit the, hit the dirt or the berm instead of the target. That is also in the 80 to 90 uh, percent of a second. So that's going to be eight tenths or nine tenths to watch it fall. These are other reasons for an intermediate shooter to consider leaving or finishing on the low port. Yeah, potentially. If our intermediate competitor is overweight or out of shape, that's another great reason to consider. <laughs> yeah. So one thing while, while I'm remembering the poppers, I've seen videos of competitors shooting matches at this range where the poppers were forward falling. Mm. If memory serves correctly, that brings a different dynamic because most of South Africa are used to backward falling poppers for the most part, and it can play a role because things happen differently between backward falling and forward falling. They appear differently, they fall differently, which can catch your peripheral. And some of them can be reset by a second shot. Oh, yeah. This is, yes. Are these the kind that could be reset by a second shot? There, there's always that potential with the forward falling popper. With these being mini, mini poppers, it's more unlikely, I think. Good. Very good. So, get out of bed, grab your gun, load the gun, have a plan for what you're going to do with your magazines. Um, and somebody who is going to finish on the low port, there wouldn't be a huge downside to leaving a mag there, just in case. You know, yep. if you're going to reload, go into that position anyway, it's not going to take you a whole lot longer to grab it off the table than it is your belt, but you need to know that ahead of time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Quick one with the, with the magazines on the table. Were they, 
when I start this stage, I still might have three or four mags on that table, but my plan might only require two. Yep. So have more mags on the table than you think you might need. Something to keep in mind. Don't go to the stage with the bare minimum <laughs> number of mags. Particularly if you think your mag is now, hopefully anybody watching this won't have a magazine that they know is unreliable, but if you're going to do a small yeah. number of mags, please bring the good ones. Bring the most accurate mags and the fastest ones. Yes. Yes. How often do you clean your mags during a match? Uh, I don't. I knew it. <laughs> when I shot open, I had the most reliable gun, certainly in the state of Ohio, maybe in the entire country. And yeah. I was I shot open for two years before I knew you were supposed to clean a magazine. I just had no idea. I didn't know. No idea. All right. Four Ipsix, one mini popper, two plates, three no shoots, seven to 15 meters. All right. Starting probably. And on... another quick start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With yeah. Uh, competitor starts with toes of both feet touching mark A as demonstrated. Mm -hmm. And the this... demonstrated thing is important because there's a lot of stuff up in the air at the moment with Ipsic and having to be perpendicular to down, uh, perpendicular to the backstop in terms of where you're looking so it's something we're not going to know until we get there but it's again it's something that could become a distraction be available and open to both opportunities more freedom less freedom be open to both so this one has between two and four shooting positions depending on how they set up the vision barriers mm -hmm. uh, very simple a, there's a slight memory element to this but not really um, it doesn't yeah. look like it's going to be too confusing for anybody. Mm. Yeah. But it doesn't appear that there's going to be anything for you to do while you're waiting for the swinger to come out. Uh, it doesn't look that way, no. And again, if we look at the sort of the size of the plates, we're talking mini poppers. Something mm. to keep in mind. Because of the distance and the size? Yep. So yep. if... Yeah, that's probably if, 15 meters. Yeah, that's the farthest target. So yeah, 15 meters. Yeah. Um, the one thing people can be doing is dry firing in match mode simulated steel. If you've got a paper plate or something maybe a little smaller than a standard paper plate, that would be a great thing to be dry firing on. Yeah. Okay. Five Ipsic, two plates, one no shoot, 12 rounds. Both feet touching the mark as demonstrated. I think this is going to be a trend that we see throughout the rest of the course of fire with that fixed starting position. Feet touching, even even the bed starts as a fixed starting position top stage. So, And it doesn't say anything about magazines on the barrel. I wonder if that barrel is really relevant. Can you think of a reason why that barrel might be here? The only reason that they might have put it there is maybe short to prevent anyone shortcutting the corner, forcing them to go all the way around the corner. So if my feet don't leave the demarcated area, I can cut that corner. Yeah, I you can jump it. from corner to corner as long as you stay in within the bounds of the demarcated area. Yeah. Very right. straightforward. There might be an opportunity for shooting on the move that right hand target. Uh, the small plate and the other small plate, depending on how the layout is. But I suspect they're going to force you into each sort of corner of that demarcated area. So if you can capitalize on that shooting on the move, it might mean taking those plates on the move, which some people will do. Some people won't have the ability to do it yet. Or the confidence, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, number eight. We're going to need to pick up the pace just a little bit here, but there's not our, sure. we've got most of our general stuff out of the way anyway. So now it'll be a little bit more stage specific. Sure. All right. Five targets, one popper, one plate, 12 rounds, five to 15 meters, all mags on table, flat on table. Yeah. So would you ever attempt one magazine on a 12 round stage? Uh, yeah, I would. Would you really? If we, if I sort of look at this stage now, they put one what appears to be a large popper, um, which I guess is going to be engaged at at that front port. It might be an option from the start where you load the gun, 
But if we look at this page in terms of air quotes, critical accuracy, the small plate on the left-hand side from where we load the gun would be the important part. And I would have the confidence to plan the stage with one magazine. If I do have a makeup on the small plate, then I'll plan a reload off the table before I leave that position. Oh, okay. That's very smart. That's outstanding. And I don't know the range of competitors that are listening to this, but very frequently when it's an unloaded start, people forget that their round count has now been reduced by one. So yeah. I just want to remind them that it's more important for production probably. Well, you, 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 yeah, you don't have any 10 round divisions. We still have, well, actually that we don't anymore, but at any rate, I just want to remind people your normal round count has been reduced by one on an unloaded start. Yeah. Okay. So this is interesting. Ideally, we'd want to shoot something else after the activator, but yep. that would require you to come in, I, I suppose, getting this guy on the way in, and then activator, then this guy, then back to the bobber. Yeah. Yeah, this, if that works out, then at least there's something happening. Yeah. This is a much nicer angle than this is for coming into that port. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And it's also a little bit easier, or it looks like it will be easier to go from the activator to that target back to the moving target. And it does appear to be a vertical bobber as opposed to a swinger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always found those much easier than swingers, depending mm -hmm. on the speed. Sure. At our last handgun nationals, they had some that were so tall that at the top of the movement, they were literally eight or nine feet in the air. They were so tall, which sure. requires... Yeah very large nobody's ever shot at that angle you know because typically it wouldn't be safe it almost feels like you're, shoot, you're shooting up yeah yeah it's yeah. very strange all right 15 targets one plate three no shoots 31 rounds starting start anywhere. anyway mm -hmm. cool so i think we could expect them well you would know better than me but could we expect them to make the starting area not necessarily obvious? Or do you think it's going to be pretty obvious? If I look at the shape of the demarcated area, it's going to be pretty obvious. Okay. Um, depending on how they lay the targets out, there might be room for you to shift that position a little bit. Um, and hopefully they build it in a way that would generate options for the competitors to pick and choose from in terms of where you would start. Maybe not necessarily in the front, but if you look at the back line, depending on how the targets are laid out, there might be an opportunity for you to push the limits moving more to the right. We'd, we'd have to see when we get there. Now, this doesn't look too complicated at all. I think we can count on these guys only be available, only available through this port. Yes, um, which would probably define the starting position of the stage. Mm -hmm. And there may be a potential to stay moving a little bit on these guys, but that, of course, depends on what happens over here. Yeah. And yep. One thing I'd like to remind people to do is, you know, think about the best position for both of these arrays as opposed to the best position for either of them, meaning there may be a really great place to shoot these guys. That means you have to move a lot more to get to where you can see these guys. Yeah. All right, five Ipsic, two poppers, seven to 15 meters, start anywhere. All right, what do you think? So depending on the size of the demarcated area, there might be good options to for start position on the stage. Um, but if, if we sort of look at the general layout again, it looks like it's going to be a three, potentially a four position or three and a half position stage with what appears to be not a lot of options. Uh, looking at this stage, we'll probably find that most of the competitor base will approach it with the same plan. Maybe a potential to start on this guy, back out on this guy, maybe. Yeah, maybe, um, yes. Or maybe a potential to back up on this guy from this position. It looks like <laughs> this guy will be available on the move on the way to the port. Um, and then that's about it. Okay. Yeah. Another short one for Ipsic, two poppers, two plates, one no shoot, 
12 rounds, both feet touching the mark on the A. Oh, look. And we've got a moving plate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Your strategy on those isn't any different than a, than a paper target, is it? No. The only thing that might change is how many targets you can get in between activation and the plate becoming visible, because sometimes they do activate quite a lot slower than a paper swinger. But as far as strategy goes in actually hitting the target, it's the same. And nobody listening to this program will do it, but many people are going to take the activator, miss this guy, shoot at it, but miss it, and then panic yeah. between getting the moving plate and the static plate that they've already missed. <laughs> but if they will if they will invest three hundredths of a second and a slightly better sight picture on this one, that won't happen. Yeah. Yep. Twelve rounds starting anywhere. Five, one and one. What do you think? So what what's really cool yeah, that I'm seeing immediately is um, most people, I guess, would start at the back of the, the stage. You've got that IT5 on the right-hand side uh, that you'd most likely start on. Depending on how visible or invisible the small plate is on the left, you could probably get away with shooting this stage while moving really nicely um, because that activator pop is visible from right at the back, which means that instead of taking risks in trying to get the small plate in, which would probably be at about 15, 15 meters, you could activate that moving target array, um, engage IT1 on the move, IT4, depending on who comes available and when. And by the time you get to the front, you just clean up the moving targets, depending on their timing and finish up on the small plate on the left. So this, this looks like it could have the potential to be a lot of fun um, and encourage some sort of not necessarily risk taking, but playing the game in terms of shooting while moving and playing with a sequence of moving targets that way around. Yeah, and on something like this, an extra pass on a swinger is going to be roughly a second, maybe a second and a half. Uh, yeah. per, so somebody who times it right is going to be a second and a half minimum ahead of somebody who times it wrong. Yeah. And you're extremely yeah. good at timing, timing swingers. Yeah. And based on these angles, are these movers going to be available anywhere but the very front of this box? Not from what I can see on the picture. Potentially the barber from the back right-hand corner, but I don't think so. Most that's likely kind of, from the front only. That's kind of that's kind of what I was looking at too. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it applies to this stage, but many people in the U.S. like to activate the movers first and then do a bunch of other stuff and then come back for the movers, failing to realize that yes, they have slowed down, but they've also slowed down how long it takes for them to come out if they're not there. So I yeah. believe it's best to control the activation the vast majority of the time. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to learn how to control swingers, Steve's going to teach you that to the T. Yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna, to, yeah. We're going to make swingers yeah. our... Well, I can't, I'm not going to say it on the family show, but you're going to make swing as your pet is what you're going to do. Yeah. Bottom line is you need to control the moving target. Don't let it control you. That's exactly right. And I also want to remind people, uh, do, do people over there know about Dry Fire King? Uh, not sure. Do you know about Dry Fire King? I may, but not off the top of my head. So... There's a there's a new YouTube channel called Dry Fire King. Mm. And there's a free side and there's a paid side. Well, even the free side, the, the free side has lots of movers that you can dry fire on. Okay. Um, so most people have pretty large TVs. I don't remember being in your house if you had a big TV. Most people have pretty big TVs nowadays. Um, but you can you can go to Dry Fire King on YouTube and see a lot of different kind of movers and practice on. Mm. I'll go have a look. I haven't seen anything like that yet. I'll go look at first. So I actually wrote those guys an email, and the subject of the email was, I am the Dry Fire King. And he responded back to me and said, yes, you are, Steve. We agree. You are the Dry Fire King. <laughs> Good. Appropriate response. What do you see here? 
Uh, this one is start anywhere. Um, the small plates are going to be a, a role player on the stage because they are going to be floating in that 15 meter range based on the distance they specified. There is potential, it's difficult to see, but there might be potential to squeeze in that partial target on the bottom right hand side of the bay in between activation of the moving target or alternatively activation, um, one of the, the left small steels and then the moving target, depending on how they build it. But there may be potential, again, for a little bit of shooting on the move or at least shifting your body in the correct direction for the stage on those small steel targets and definitely on the that partial array on the left. And what I want to remind people of is the, the shooter that wins this stage inside of each class and division will be the one that goes clean on those metal plates. Yes. Um, at your level, you're not likely to fire six shots at three plates, but when you guys are waiting for a sight picture on those 15 meter steel, it's going to feel like it's taking forever for your sight to stabilize. If you fire the shot before that happens, you're just going to have to do it again. So you might yeah, as well. That's, that's what us as handgun shooters often neglect is that when we decide to fire the shot before there's an acceptable sight picture, we actually have to start from beginning again to fire the next one. That's right. That's right. Yes. All right. And that is, of course, something else you will learn if you come spend some time with me while I'm in South Africa. I, I am. I, I know so much about shooting that one of the first things I can teach people is that if the sight is not on the target, when you press the trigger, the shot will not be good. <laughs> oh, that's strange. I always joke that a, a well-written owner's manual for a red dot sight would put me out of business. So I hope nobody writes one. <laughs> And we'll just keep an eye on them for you. Yeah, we'll just have to keep a secret here. Okay. So you you have the luxury of starting anywhere in this giant demarcated area. Yes. Um, so it, it's not something we see a lot in IPSC anymore where we've got such a small box where it, it would ultimately become a stand and deliver stage. Um, which is pretty cool. Uh, in America, they call these speed shoots. Ah, okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so probably start on the activator, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Either the activator or the small plate on the right-hand side. Uh, you can knock him down, activator, um, IT1, that partial array, and then back onto the moving target. That that would keep your gun going in a, in a, a more, in a nicer direction instead of going back and forth. That, that's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. pretty simple. Yep. As earlier, it depends on how they set the swingers up in terms of strategy. That's all. And that would be something that if you have the ability to watch other shooters shoot it, potentially taking a video of that sequence, full speed, slow motion could, could be very helpful. Oh yeah. Remember, remember when they had that stage with four activators and four swingers and they were all arguing about it and I've, brought you over to the bench and showed you my video and then you destroyed the stage <laughs> yeah i still got that video somewhere that was a great one. Oh yeah my first time's there i think all right sorry that was i think it was the first time yeah first or second 12 rounds 5 to 15 meters start anywhere start anywhere Shoot oh. the This is interesting. Kind of makes you wonder, oh, I see, yeah. So this is one where walking the entire demarcated area may show you something that you don't see if you just start walking the stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there there may be a place to stand to get all this from one position, or there may not. Um, there may not, yeah. Probably and won't. They, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the two targets that are sort of hidden by the vision barriers, IT2 and IT3, to me, it looks like they might be encouraging or forcing IT2 to be shot from the very front left-hand corner of the demarcated area. 
So that's something to keep in mind. That might add a, add a little bit of a memory component. That's why, as you said, walking on the outside of the demarcated area will be valuable or potentially valuable. And with these three plates, somebody, hopefully nobody listening to this program, but somebody is going to spend 10 seconds on those three plates. Yeah. And that's yeah. not going to Okay. I don't see a lot else to talk about here. That looks pretty, pretty simple. No. And yeah. sh anybody that can call their shots on steel is going to have so much better time with this guy. Um, Cause it looks like he can only be shot from here. Right. This, this corner. Yes. And yeah. That's have, what I'm saying. If we have to stand there and watch him fall or we can call that shot. That's going to save a lot of time on that guy. Absolutely. All right, 23 rounds, 10 paper, three plates, one no shoot. Heels on the A. All right. Oh, look, another one. Very positional. Yep. Yeah, I think lots of positions. Depending on the array from where you start, it might be worth shooting the left hand targets closest to your starting position while backing yourself into the right hand side of that leg or it might be a better option to get onto that hard cover partial through the port the other targets and then the ones down range and you can then shoot the ones from the start position on more from the left hand side while moving down range so those might be both viable options depending on your 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 strengths and confidence and i think of all the targets that we've looked at so far Number 10 here is the one most likely to have a miss. <laughs> yes. Yes. And for those of you that don't know me or Gaz very well, I'm sure everybody knows Gaz, but the higher level competitors, some of them will disrespect this target and they'll try to take it on a gallop. They'll try to fire two shots on one site picture. And I'm going to predict there's going to be a lot of misses just into the black. All right. Four paper, two poppers, two plates, one no shoot, 12 rounds, five to 15 meters. Guess these stages are all virtually the same. I mean, this is just the same thing over and over and over again. That, that's how it's looking on paper for sure. You know, when, when I see the shape of the stage, yeah, it's got a moving target. To me, it looks like it might have a right hand side opening, which means two on one pass is simpler. But when we look at the shape of the demarcated area and we look at the layout of vision barriers, they're ultimately going to force us into three corners of this triangle. That's going to be the name of the game. And because a retreat is required, this is would be something to dry fire. Yes. And yep. you, you've got a couple of opportunities to be moving backwards as you shoot some of these things. So that would be something that you'd want to dry fire without a part time in a match mode environment. If anybody that could stay moving through here uh, is going to win the stage. Yes. Provided that's an option. Unfortunately, sure. that's, that's true. Very true. Yep. Very true. Yeah, because even if you can be backing up on this guy, you've still got to deal with the mover. So, yeah, you're right. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe, maybe not. Joe. We'll see when we get there. All right. Another short course. It's let's see, starting anywhere. It's guys, yeah. this these stages are all virtually the same. You've got you've got paper, you've got steel, you've got positional shooting. Um again, anybody who can handle these three steel clean is gonna be saving at least three seconds over somebody who can't. Well, one second. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And the closer we're getting to the, the end of this this specific course of fire, the more that I'm sort of seeing, there, yes, there's one or two stages where there's determining factors like the bed stage, maybe the bed's an important component to that stage in terms of it being an unloaded start. But a lot of this, and maybe one or two of the stages in terms of moving target sequences and that timing being important, but the vast majority of the stages, the most, Im not, I don't know how to word it correctly, but the most important component is going to be the steel on the stage. Yes. Match um, to say control the steel, control the match. Yeah. And this looks very heavy in that in that sort of line. 
Every single That's one. That's a better of these, way of phrasing it. Every single one of these plates is plus or minus a second and a half. Yeah. Okay. Because it looks like a lot of them are going to be placed ten meters and out. Not to mention the possibility of a standing reload, potentially depending on stage plan and everything else. Yeah. And considering production capacity, um, 12 round stage, you've got 16 on the gun. You have one or two too many makeups or a little bit of impatience here and there, and you work yourself into a reload on a 12 round stage. And this is not a universal statement, but I find that anytime somebody goes into the stage and tries to do it without a reload, let's say it's a 13 or 14 or even 15 round stage, it usually causes them to shoot conservatively and it usually causes them to under try. So yeah. unless most of the time, at the very least having another magazine available or a plan and a potential contingency reload, in my opinion, is better than trying to do it all in one mag. Yeah. And if we, when we get to some of these stages while we're there, there might be a stage where the influence is so heavy on the stage that it's worthwhile just doing the reload on the 12 round stage and saving yourself that hassle and giving yourself that um, peace of mind and confidence that just, you just have to execute your skills. Whereas if you're running on the edge or something like you said, you run conservative. But what often happens to a lot of competitors who haven't done mental management, for example, he will think more about not missing than he will about hitting the targets, which will result in a miss. When when open guns first began to hold 30 rounds, I never had more than 27 plus one, but we'd get to a 30 round stage and they would spend four of their five minutes debating whether to do it without a reload. So dumb. If it's a 30 round stage, there is going to be a place to do a reload that's not going to cost you any time. Absolutely. All right. Do you see anything here that's uh, it's the same stuff? It's the same. This one's just got more bullets or requires more bullets. Um, but again, very positional. If we look at how compact the vision barriers are and the, the density of the targets, it's going to be get to this position, engage your targets, move to this position, engage your targets. Um, something to highlight is that with those kinds of stages and this kinds of match, it's going to be about making sure your gun's up and ready to shoot when that target becomes available. And we we really started highlighting, once I figured out a way to, to have you guys work on the shuffle that didn't require the boxes that we normally do them, um, any short period of lateral movement has got to be a shuffle. And yeah. it is the easiest thing you can do around your house because most of your household movements, like if you think about coffee maker to the cabinet, four feet, three feet, perfect place to practice. It's within shuffle distance. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. If, if you like to eat truffles, you could do a shuffle on the way to your truffle. It would be fine. <laughs> yes. If you carry a duffel bag, you could carry your duffel while you do a shuffle on your way to eat a truffle. Exactly. And then you're building leg strength at the same time. If you, you like put a couple spin. of pickle bells in there like Joey. Oh, this looks interesting. Starting anywhere, push button at A activates three. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So this so looks like, yeah. this appears this like to be Sorry. more of the more head scratchers. We call them head scratchers if they're a little bit confusing when you look at them. Mm -hmm. What do you see when you look at this one? Um, this one, they, they obviously, with the shape of a demarcated area, they're going to try and get us into each corner of, of that. And it looks like even some of the um, inverted corners on the inside of the corner, not just the outside, towards the towards the most natural side of the, the bay. Um, what's going to be interesting is how they apply this push button. Um, if they can build a push button that is electric, it may have different influences on the timing of the swinger that no one's used to. So this is most likely going to be a moving target no one's experienced before. Which is fine. If nobody's experienced it before, you're in the same boat as the guy next to you. Um, other than that, it looks like it will be fairly straightforward. Potential opportunity to shoot the small plates at the back of the bay moving down that main corridor of the J. 
Um, depending on how that's going to play out, even though we have to go down there, it might just save you that little bit of, of time while you're down there and encourage you to shoot the other targets while moving as well. And I don't really like to use negative terms, but this one could go downhill very quickly if somebody got in a panic. Yes. Because you've got two different movers, two different activators. Uh, this would be one where you'd want to get a simple, reliable stage plan and really think about execution as opposed to how tricky and fancy your plan is. Yeah. Uh, looking at it quickly, this one appears to provide more options and certainly more confusion. Yes. Uh, there's a slight memory element to it uh, that's going to be important. So this this is one. Let's get a simple stage plan we can remember as quickly as possible. Well, I mean, it's no different than other, but on this stage specifically, um, yeah. somebody is going to lose their division on this stage. Let's just put it that way, right? Mm -hmm. So let's yeah. make sure it's not anybody listening to this program. It's for sure not going to be you, but no. this is this is cool. All right, another medium course, both heels touching the A's, 21 rounds, 15 meters, moving plate, activator in the front. Yeah, little bear trap. Yeah, is it possible for you to know what this activator is going to look at? Uh, sorry, look like? Not not at the moment, no. It might be something that I get access to before I shoot the main match, um, but at the moment I have no idea how that foot activation will work. And at least for us, the competitors are usually not allowed to practice activating the thing during the stage. Is that the case for you as well? Um, on the initial walkthrough during the briefing, the competitor would be first to shoot that stage, maybe awarded the opportunity to activate the moving target. But otherwise, no. You'll get to simulate activation during the three or five minute walkthrough that we get. So all thing I want to tell people, depending on how this thing is constructed, sometimes they take a lot of force to activate. And I have seen people activate them kind of cautiously and then have to go back and do it again. So you want to activate that thing aggressively. Some With a lot of them being mechanical, they'll have a setup that's normally not down the middle because of the way the door works. It will be on either side. So check which side that mechanism is and put your foot on that side of the box. There we go. Or put your whole body on that side of the box, depending on how it's built. Maybe some opportunities to do some shooting while moving, but you may have to choose between shooting and getting to that activator. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. 10 paper, one popper, two plates, one no shoot. 23. Uh, again, feet touching A. So a lot of rigidity in terms of start position, and it's both feet. Which most likely means for us IPSC guys that we have to assume um, the diagram that they've got in the rule book. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's Appendix E2. Um, now the moving target looks like a bobber up down. And it looks like, do you see any place other than this little tiny doorway, this aperture here where all this can be shot? Oh, uh, no, that looks like it would be the only place that they'd, that you could engage that array from. And they're going to force you deep into this corner, which means that's the most likely end position. Yes. Uh, yes. Maybe a, an opportunity for movement here. So, so this is one where sometimes you'll get to a stage like this and these targets that look like they're about eight to 10 meters could wind up being very close depending on the, on the bay. Right. Yes. So these, these could turn into hoser targets very, very easily to the size of the bay. Yeah. Yeah. We learned that at hand. Yeah. When we got there, there were a couple of targets that were looking to be 10 yards away that were almost close enough to touch with your hand that's how close they actually were yeah yeah and with this with these diagrams in specific actually being visually not accurate to scale um 
it will be a little bit more difficult to judge, but you can bargain on it going one of both. It could go both ways. If it come closer, it might go out a bit, bit further. Yeah. And you know, Gaz, I don't know if I have ever seen a stage that was more difficult on the ground than it looked on paper. And meaning most of the times when I look at the matchbook and see the actual stages, the stages are easier than they look in the matchbook. Has that been your experience? Yes. Absolutely, yeah. That's right. Yep. All right. Well, I, I thought we had 30 stages to look like, but, but it looks like we're done. Yeah, we smashed out the 22 stages. Outstanding. All right. So, yeah. so just to recap, roughly a week outside of the match, we need to be doing primarily match mode dry fire, which means setting up things like this in your house and practicing leaving only acceptable shots on them. Um, that is... Yeah number one thing we can get people to do in class very quickly. Um, you want to be dry firing your shuffle steps. And we didn't see a lot of opportunities to shoot while moving, but that is an easy thing to do on dry fire if you want to just increase your confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are you going to be doing a week out in training? Um, I'm, I'm already sort of doing what you've highlighted in terms of doing a lot more um structured stuff that is more in line with what we could expect to see at the match so more um matched like skills maybe not to the point where i'm trying to simulate the entire stage but i'm taking key elements that we'll see over and over and over again during the match getting into position early making sure the guns are up high just maintaining my transitions for for what they are making sure that i'm being accountable with them so shot calling with the transitions um, and then I am still throwing in a lot of shooting on the move because while we might not see it here, it might not be applied in the traditional sense of what we see in shooting on the move, but it might present me opportunities to shift my body weight or take half a step towards that next position, which in my opinion is shooting on the move. Yeah. It's, so yeah, we want to be able to do it from there all the way through to a full walk, maybe even a sprint depending on target difficulty. The other thing I'd like to remind people of is there's a lot of places in this match where leaving on steel is something that you're going to have to do. Um, so I would encourage people to set up a movement exercise that requires them to call a shot on steel and dry fire, move to a new position. I would personally use, if I was going to shoot this match, I don't have anything here in front of me. Um, you could use like a CR2023 battery. If you've got an old one lying around. But shooting, dry firing a, sm a steel on the small side to simulate distance and having to leave that position, having called that shot, um, I would want to do a lot of that. Have I seen what I need to see? Do I know that's going to be a hit? Can I leave with authority instead of fear? Yeah. Okay. And that's also a case of getting com comfortable with that simulated distance your sites are going to occupy well over 80%, maybe even 90% of what's available on that target when you're looking down site. So getting comfortable with that is also important. And just in case people are watching this that don't know about match mode dry fire, there's usually not a time component in match mode dry fire. It's really all about calling every shot as acceptable without consciously slowing down. I've now talked to two people, guys, who think that match mode dry fire means consciously doing it in slow motion. I have never told anybody that, right? No. But these are people, I think, who presume that good match mode shooting requires them to consciously slow down, which is also not the case. Um, and just to remind people, learning how to shoot without the conscious control of speed is the most important thing that I can teach them. Uh, Surely you went through a phase of speeding up, slow down, speed up, slow down, right? Um, no, I didn't have have a speed up, slow down phase during my training or my progress, even at matches. Um, what I typically did, which was the best fail safe for me at the time, was to spend my life consciously slow down and basically in bullseye mode. Ah, okay. That was a safe space for me. So the scores generally look good. My times were relatively competitive some to most of the time so that was a good comfort zone for me 
it was most days. What do you do now? Now I just run it um, pure match mode. All I'm doing is using my vision to confirm when I'm doing things correctly. And importantly, that my vision notices when things aren't correct and they need to be rectified. I I could talk to you all day, but I have a I have a mental management yeah. online class to get to, and I'm sure I'm sure you're going to be going to bed soon, or at least doing something different than talking to me. <laughs> I enjoy talking to you, so would awesome. ultimately probably be going to bed. Awesome. All right, guys, I want to thank you for tuning in to me and Gaz sharing the matchbook with you and some general match and training strategies. Um, I will be in South Africa in the month of May, towards the end of the month of May. And if you would like to see me and learn about all this stuff, uh, I'm sure we can arrange to have gas hanging around for some of this stuff too. We haven't talked about it, but I'm sure we could arrange for some of that to happen. There's, there will be scope for that, yes. Very good. All right, Absolutely. and if you want to sign up for the classes we're doing in South Africa, get a hold of Shanae. I would imagine most people know how to do that. If you don't know how to get a hold of Shanae, get a hold of me, Steve at AndersonShooting.com, and I will connect you to her. Uh, she's literally become my Sharon Osborne when I'm in when I'm in uh, South Africa. So obviously we're not married, but I'm Ozzy, you know. Shanae, Shanae. <laughs> Especially once the whiskey starts getting poured. That's when that's much more likely. So, <laughs> all right, yeah. any last words of advice for people going to this match? Um, I think my last bit of advice is make sure that your your gear is working, it's functional, it's reliable. Um, and from there, it's a case of just going to the match, enjoying it for what it is, um, and taking the opportunity as it presents itself. And I would also like to... Uh, extend my condolences to the ultimate second place finisher in production optics, whoever that might be. <laughs> All right, guys, it was great talking to you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for your time. Always awesome. Thanks for be, thanks for allowing me on the show with you. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Have a good one. Cheers.